Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another CHP episode. This is Laszlo Montgomery once again. I appreciate you all stopping by and listening. Another special episode today, as it always is, whenever I'm able to trick a guest into coming on the program. And to tell the story of this subject, well, I think will be of interest to musicians and non-musicians alike. It's my good friend from the neighborhood, Dr. Hao Huang, professor of music at Scripps College, founded in 1926 here in Claremont, California, where we're recording from today. In person, none of this Zoom or <laughs> Zencaster stuff. Dr. Huang is educated at Harvard, Juilliard, and State University of New York. He's also a four-time United States Information Agency Artistic Ambassador to Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And he has a list of awards, concert appearances, and accomplishments longer than the uh, Karakoram Highway. Just about. Hao Huang, welcome to the CHP. It's a pleasure to be with you. (laughs) Great to have you. And I have no uh, small number of Hakka listeners here in the U.S. and around the world. Anything you'd like to say to your uh, fellow Hakkas? Sure. As a proud descendant of the Hunan Huangs, I'll say Fong Yang. Uh, okay. Hunan Huang. Which part of Hunan were the Huangs from? They're from Wanli Wu, which is near Shangsha. Ah. Did you ever get to visit the ancestral home? Yes, and it had been completely flattened by the Japanese, so there was one hut in the ah. middle of it. All right. Well... And you uh, were also the producer and presenter of the podcast, Blood on Gold Mountain, that dramatized the events leading up to and during the 1871 L.A. Chinatown Massacre. And that was powerful. You and Micah really put on a moving performance, and I really enjoyed the whole thing. Now, a lot of people, coast to coast, especially here in Cali, pitched in to raise awareness about this little-known event from L.A. history. A lot of organizations, besides yourselves, held uh, all kinds of vigils and events and remembrance. And the music was great for that one you produced and performed right at the scene of the location of the 1871 massacre. Thanks for your kind thoughts. My son, Micah Huang, wrote the sound score, and we wanted to help recover a neglected traumatic past that unfortunately stays relevant today. How did you get started with this topic of these Jewish musicians who, you know, due to events happening in Europe, ended up being part of this whole scene during the war years in Shanghai, 1937 and 1945? Well, recently I've been writing about German music in China for a few books in Asian German studies. And being a musician, I was approached to write a book chapter on this topic. I jumped at the chance because my boys are both Chinese Jewish Americans and my wife is Swiss Jewish. And a uh, musician as well? Yes, a violinist. (laughs) So I guess Micah had no choice with his uh, (laughs) career. Neither Micah nor (laughs) Joga. Well, I think that one of the things which made German and Austrian Jews uh, go to Shanghai was the anti-Semitic, uh, I can only say, pogrom and program to excise them from social and economic life in greater Germany. And frankly, Shanghai was the port of last resort. It was a place where they could immigrate more or less freely and the German authorities did not try to stop them. Yeah, they, uh, you know, all the laws that were passed sort of squeezed the Jews out. And then August 1934, Hitler became dictator. And then the Nuremberg laws and more concentration camps open. By 1938, it was the Anschluss. And then finally, in November, uh, Kristallnacht. And that really had a huge impact on the number of Jews that were flooding into Shanghai. Yes, yes. And, and it, it is, again, was just a, incrementally more and more statutes and laws that were discriminatory uh, towards Jews. Well, there were many heroes who mm-hmm. stepped up in 1938. In the, in the Chinese context, we remember He Feng Shan mm-hmm. and all the good deeds he did. And I spoke at length about him in that uh, six-part series on the Jewish refugees in Shanghai. So what role did He Feng Shan play in helping these musicians? You know, who was he and how did he help? 
Well, he was the consul general of the consulate of the Republic of China in Vienna. And as a consul general, he issued about maybe 5,000 entry visas to Austrian Jews to go to Shanghai, even though his superior, Ambassador Chen Jie, uh, held that assisting Jews might anger the Nazis and discouraged it. And just to give some sort of perspective, uh, Schindler issued 1,200 visas, which is one quarter of what He did. Yeah, he was a great man, posthumously received no small amount of praise for his humanity. And along with Oskar Schindler, also Sugihara Chiune and Jan Zwartendijk and others, you know, they were all accepted into Yad Vashem, righteous among nations and acknowledged for their humanity at this uh, dark hour. So... The pre-war jazz scene in Shanghai, many of us are quite familiar with that already and, and know and love it. But let's discuss the classical music scene in Shanghai, 1930s and 40s. What venues offered live classical music and who were the musicians who performed? Right. Well, I'd like to go back to almost before the big immigration in about 38, 39. Uh, this would be in the sort of mid-30s, uh, the first phase of the Austro-German Jewish immigration. And Shanghai's musical life then took place in quite a few bars, coffee houses, dance halls, theaters. There was only one concert hall, the Lyceum Theater, which was for symphonic and serious music. And actually, in 1939, a cultural report stated that the musicians mostly consisted of Filipinos, Italians and Russians, who dominated Shanghai's musical life. The theaters, lacking talent, were below the standard. And he's referring to the Shanghai a Municipal Symphony Orchestra. The level there was moderate. In fact, the musicians' training was unsatisfactory. Mm. And what about the music scene in, say, Austria, Germany? Right. Uh, you know, what, what were these Jews leaving behind? Well, I think one of the things which is really important is to understand that all of culture was subject to Nazification from January 1933 on. So... You know, there is, I believe, a policy we call Gleichschaltung, which is coordination, Nazi coordination of culture, which meant that music had to conform to the Nazi ideal. So some composers were tolerated and even elevated to the status of pure Aryan music. But others, like Mendelssohn and Meyerbeer, were banned because they were Jewish. So even Schoenberg's music, and we'll touch on him later, was banned because it was too radical and, in the mind of Hitler, simply not classically German. And uh, Schoenberg also happened to be a Jew who had converted to Protestantism in about 1898 when he was about 23. So I think what's really important is that Gleichschaltung was a system of totalitarian control over all aspects of society. And the Nazis sought to sort of unify the economy and trade associations to the media, culture, and education institutions. This not only covered composers, but orchestras were purged of Jews as were casts of operas. For Hitler, only true Aryans could authentically perform German music. Famous Jewish musicians were forced into exile. Now, ironically, by fleeing Nazi Germany pre-1939, they may well have saved their lives and also preserved and carried music, German music, to other shores, such as Shanghai. What did that mean to the community of musicians in Shanghai when the sudden influx of Jewish musicians started showing up in the late 30s and early 40s? Right. Well, I think maybe for the public, it was great because you get to hear great music, but maybe for the existing musicians, they probably were edged out. So just to give you some context, by the late 1930s, several Austro-German Jewish refugee musicians arrived in Shanghai who had achieved distinguished careers in Europe. And these included violinist Alfred Witt, who was a pupil of Brahms' friend and colleague Joseph Joachim, and uh, also Wittenberg was the winner of the Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi Prize. Um, pianist Hans Bauer, who was a pupil of Arthur Schnabel, um, he was the winner of the Ebach Prize and uh, former dean of the Berlin Conservatory of Music. And uh, pianist and conductor Henry Margolinsky, who was the Kapellmeister of the Stadttheater von Eisenach. And there were others, of course. 
What this meant was that these expert professional musicians satisfied the high art aspirations of German-speaking Jewish refugees who were forced by circumstances to realize that their appreciation of Beethoven, Brahms, or Goethe did not depend on being identified by the Nazis as German nationals. During the early years of World War II, classical music performances in Shanghai were transnational. They took place in the French General Assembly, the American Women's Club, XMHA Radio, and the American Social Hall. It was, I think, in the International Chapel there, and these were all located in the French concession. Due to the strains on a wartime economy, classically trained musicians often took jobs at cabarets, variety shows, and performances staged in coffee houses and small popular theaters where logistical complications were minimal and pay was guaranteed. How did the daily lives of these musicians differ from their fellow Shanghai Jews who engaged in uh, other trades or didn't work at all? Well, I probably it was sort of extreme freelancing, uh, as as actually a number of musicians uh, are doing right now everywhere in the world. But for the Shanghai musicians, it was feast or famine. If you landed performance gigs, you ate. If you didn't land a job, you might not eat at all. So musicians tried to earn regular incomes by giving lessons, but that was an equivalent to taking in a regular salary from a business. Students came and went. Families prioritized life necessities for survival over piano lessons. So if anything, life as a Jewish refugee musician in Shanghai was harder than elsewhere because economic resources were so limited in Japanese-occupied Shanghai. Uh, I think that that's something that we really need to understand. This was even before Hankyu Ghetto, uh, when they Mm. were rounded up. Um, So it was a tough life for the 300 or so Jewish refugee professional musicians in Shanghai during World War II. Let's look at some of these musicians and the impact they had on this musical scene in Shanghai during the 40s. I mean, you describe them as the modernist, the fiddler, the movie star, and the Shanghai Rose Boys. Frankel, Schloss, Steiner, (laughs) Wittenberg, Floor, and the Joachim Brothers. Now, first of all, uh, before we do anything, what is 20th century musical modernism? (laughs) Yeah, and frankly, it's that mean is still being developed, developed, (sighs) because I think very few... People actually agree on what modernism means, but I'll give you my perspective. So I believe that it's not just a music style. It's more like an aesthetic approach. It's a philosophy that is grounded in a belief in progress and science, anti-romanticism, general intellectualism, and breaking with the tradition or common practice of the past. It's Ezra Pound's modernist slogan, Make It New, which is applied to music. And it was produced to reflect the complications and anxieties of the modern age of the 20th century, especially through the two world wars. And why were Frankel, Schloss, and Steiner particularly noteworthy? Those three big names. What did these Austro-German musicians mean to local Chinese aspiring musicians and what opportunities did it afford them? You know, what was the impact and what was the legacy? Right. That's such an important question. And what I think it can be explained by is that of several hundred Jewish musicians who fled greater Germany to live in Shanghai, only three, those three, qualify as representatives of 20th century musical modernism. Berlin composer, musician, and ex-civil judge Wolfgang Frankel, who was born 1897, died in 1983. Alban Berg's German amanuensis Julius Schloss from 1902 to 1972. And pianist Karl Steiner. Uh, His dates are 1912 to 2001. So as young men, these men were all deeply influenced by the second Viennese school of Schoenberg, Berg, and Webern, and all three arrived the same year in Shanghai in 1939 as refugees from Nazism after spending some time in concentration camps. So honestly, their music was of no interest to the general music listening public in Shanghai, um, either Chinese or Jewish, because they 
they wrote music that wasn't uh, wasn't happy making for audience ears. They composed less than a handful of works during their time in Shanghai. Karl Steiner found that no one was interested in him as a composer or a teacher, so he had to try to support himself by intermittently playing at bars and cafes during his entire residence in Shanghai, which lasted ten years. But the other two, Frankel and Schloss, became extremely influential composition teachers at the Shanghai Music Conservatory, whose students became music and cultural leaders during the early decades of the People's Republic of China. As eminent national composers, music critics, presidents of conservatories, famous teachers in their own right, these German Jewish musicians nurtured a new. Chinese art music practice that involved a sophisticated amalgamation of Western music elements and pre 20th century Chinese music that symbolically represent a distinct national character. Barbara Mittler suggests that a paradigm shift has been made. The term Chinese music is no longer exclusively reserved for indigenous Chinese traditional music, but this has broadened to encompass a new hybrid music, which is a product of negotiation with Western musical influence. So this new Chinese music shares the same temporal space as new music in the West. So then, what about、uh, the so-called composer and professor Wolfgang Frankel? Yeah, he's pretty interesting. He sure is. Well, he, first of all, he has a great first name, right, Wolfgang?、Um, but、uh, he was born in Berlin. He was educated as a lawyer and worked as a judge at the Berlin Court of Appeal until April 1933, when the Nazis instituted the law for the restoration of professional civil service, which. Basically, excluded Jews and other politically unreliable people from civil service. So he was lucky to have been extensively trained in music as a child. So Frankel took lessons from the members of the Waldemeyer String Quartet and later studied piano and music theory at the Kinderf Scharwenka Conservatory. After being interned in Sachsenhausen concentration camp for one or two months post Kristallnacht. Frankel was released on the promise that he would leave Germany at once. So he disembarked at Shanghai on May seventh, nineteen thirty-nine. He was forty-two years of age. Stripped of financial resources, Frankel decided to start working as a performing musician almost immediately upon his arrival, and he was hired as a violinist for the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra. Two years later, Frankel joined the theory and composition faculty of the National Vocational Music School. The the National Vocational Music School. Yes, yes, and that was later renamed the Shanghai Music Conservatory, which has become world famous. That was later renamed the Shanghai Music Conservatory, which has become world famous. He provided instruction in tonal harmony, counterpoint analysis, instrumentation, and composition, and introduced Arnold Schoenberg's essay "Composition in Twelve Tones" to Asia. So Frankel's students found him a methodical but iconoclastic thinker. Zhou Guangren, later a prominent piano faculty member of the Beijing Central Conservatory of Music and recognized as one of China's foremost music educators, reports that Frankel once advised her to throw dice to determine the best harmonic progression for a certain melody instead of limiting herself to obey conventional harmonic rules. And this is decades before John Cage became very famous for doing the same thing in his music Tao Te Ching. So when did、uh, Frankel leave Shanghai, or did he stay behind? Well, he left Shanghai at the beginning of the Chinese Civil War between the People's Liberation Army and the Guomindang National Army、uh, in about 1947, early in that year, and he moved to Los Angeles later that year, where he resumed his compositional activities. And sadly, although Frankel was a remarkably prolific composer who wrote nearly two hundred pieces over his lifetime, only four were published while he was alive. Wow! And my favorite, the violinist and teacher Alfred Wittenberg. What about him? He was a pupil of Brahms. <laughs> You're so right. He was, I think, a student at the Musikhochschule Berlin. Where he was awarded the Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi Prize for violin in 1901, he was also a very well-respected pianist. He was a double threat, so to speak. <laughs> After surviving the terrors of Kristallnacht, 
Wittenberg emigrated to Shanghai in 1939 with his wife and mother-in-law. He was already 59 years old. So the year he arrived, he gave numerous public concerts and appeared on XMHA radio. In time, his meticulous artistic teaching gained him great renown. He attained a reputation as Professor of Professors, which I think was meant to be a compliment, uh, <laughs> as more and more Chinese violin and piano students gravitated to him. So, Alfred Wittenberg, how did he uh, adapt to life uh, in Shanghai when he was there? How yeah. did he... It's amazing because you have many first-person accounts of German Jews in Shanghai complaining about the poverty, the dirt, you know, uh, starvation, literally. But there were some, like Wittenberg, who felt comfortable enough in Shanghai that in 1941, so this is two years after he got to Shanghai, after one of his students offered him a life in the United States with good job opportunities, a house and a car— Wittenberg chose to stay in Shanghai. Upon the Japanese establishment of a restricted area for stateless refugees, which meant Jews from Greater Germany, in 1943, Wittenberg and his family were forced to move into a tiny apartment in the Hankyu ghetto. And subsequently, his performing and teaching income was cut drastically. And uh, while he was there, there was a, I mentioned him in my series, the, the King of the Jews, Kano Goya. Did he have any run-ins with uh, Goya? The yes. infamous Goya? The infamous Goya. I think it was hard not to have run-ins with Goya. But, but as someone who was uh, significant in the Jewish society community in Hankyu Ghetto, of course, yes, Wittenberg had a very unpleasant encounter with Mr. Goya. Um, he was the Japanese official responsible for giving monthly passes to Jews who were living in Hankyu Ghetto. So Goya, who fancied himself an amateur violinist, and we know about those, uh, requested that Wittenberg accompany him at the piano. Now, you would think, what could possibly go wrong with that, right? But at one rehearsal, Wittenberg's interpretation displeased Mr. Goya, whereupon Goya menaced Wittenberg thusly. You play as I want it, or I kill you. <laughs> this is an instructive case of artistic disagreement resolving in coercion through the threat of execution. Now, that's even very special for among musicians. We, we, we threaten other things. You don't get... Yeah, that doesn't happen too often. No, no, that's a real critic. After the Japanese surrender in 1945, free from Goy's bullying... Wittenberg was hired to teach at the Shanghai Music Conservatory. In 1952, three years after the communist victory over the nationalists, Wittenberg died at age 72 from a heart attack while playing the violin. He never left Shanghai, having lived there for 13 years. He died doing what he loved. Yes. Small consolation, though. Mm. Well, what about... Lily Flor, the movie star, the <laughs> singer. What about her? She's uh, she's got a great story. Yeah, you you have more your high, higher taste, uh, Laszlo, for uh, picking on Wittenberg. I think Lily was my favorite when I found out about her. So Lily Flor, her natal name was Elizabeth Gunsberger. Uh, she was born in 1893, died in 1978. Had a long life. She was a well-known Viennese stage and film actress during the silent movie era. So we're talking about the 20s, I think. And uh, she made her stage debut in the Raymond Theater in Vienna at the age of eight. So she was a real prodigy. It's not just musicians. Her first feature film was Ein Lied uh, von Hass und Liebe, which was in 1918. So over the next decade, that's the 20s, she went on to star in a dozen other movies. Floor was also active as a stage singer, regularly performing between filmings, appearing in the Berlin Neue Operettenhaus, the Kunstlerhaus, and the Theater des Westerns, which is uh, sometimes referred to uh, as the Western Theater, uh, also the Metropolitan uh, Theater, the Scala, and Wintergarten. So, uh, Lily Floor, how did she end up leaving Germany? She got caught up in the net as well? Right, right. And it's really... It's extraordinary and yet not, right? There were many distinguished Jewish uh, people who were 
uh, exiled or worse, killed by the Nazis. Lily, although she was a well-established professional singer after the introduction of sound films to Germany in 1930, found that she was no longer in demand as a film actress. Now, perhaps it's because she was nearing 40, which is an older age for film actresses, especially at that time. But by the mid-30s, Floor was banned from performing in public because she was Jewish. And in 1939, following the Anschluss, Lily Floor emigrated to Shanghai, where she was hailed by her fellow refugees as one of the most renowned cabaret artists and actresses in their community. So at the age of 42, she continued her stage career alongside other German-speaking emigres, achieving acclaim both in operetta and theater. Now, it's very interesting that after World War II ended, in 1946, the indefatigable Floor reprised her starring role as Polly in the Three Penny Opera, which is just a great piece. I, I really enjoy that, 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 uh, that opera. Um, no one has been able to find out when Floor left Shanghai to live in New South Wales, Australia, where she spent the remainder of her life. She died and was buried on a sheep farm at the age of 85. In Australia. In Australia. (laughs) Great country. Yeah. Okay. The Joachim brothers, Shanghai Rose. Let's uh, talk about yes. them. This is uh, something they got. They got mentioned in uh, in an old uh, series I did on the Shanghai jazz scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Joachim brothers. They were Jewish refugee musicians who performed both popular and classical music in Shanghai. There wasn't this clear division that's been made, you know, later on. They just were players. So the Joachims organized a popular band and recorded thirty records in Shanghai. One of them featured Rose, Rose, I Love You, a popular Chinese Mandarin pop song, which is better known outside China as Shanghai Rose or China Rose. It's the only Chinese pop song that reached the top 10 in Europe and the USA as sung by Frankie Lane. Well, one of the great stories uh, to come out of that music scene. Yeah, it's just amazing. Well, let's go to Otto Joachim, who's the elder brother. He was born in 1910, died 100 years later in uh, 2010. He was born in Dusseldorf, where he studied violin with Julius Booth. And in 1934, he left Germany for Asia and stayed for 15 years, working first in Singapore and then in Shanghai as a radio shop storekeeper, studio producer, performer, and music teacher. They had to do lots of things to keep alive. Otto supported himself by organizing bands to play what was referred to as Unterhaltungsmusik in bars and cafes. This is popular music of the time, which included jazz. And he produced also record albums and taught music lessons. And what about after uh, Liberation, 1949? Did he stick around? Yeah, Otto left Shanghai in 1949, intending to emigrate to Brazil. This is, of course, during the Civil War again, during, you know, when uh, finally uh, the the Communist Army, the PLA, uh, took over Shanghai. And en route uh, to Brazil, Otto stayed in Montreal, where he decided to stay. Now, I'm not sure, but I don't think Montreal is on the way to Brazil, but my geography may be mixed up. But by the 1950s, Otto joined the Montreal Symphony Orchestra as a first violinist, And in 1956, he began to teach at McGill University, uh, founded his own electroacoustic music research studio, fully converted to the 12-tone system of the Second Viennese School, and became a leader in Canada's modernist avant-garde music movement. What about younger brother Walter, Walter Joachim? Yeah. So Walter was two years younger than Otto, and he began studying the violin at age four. Like most younger brothers, he followed his older brother's footsteps. But at five, he switched to the cello. After taking lessons at the Music Conservatory in Dusseldorf, he entered the Rheinische Musikschule in Cologne at 17. Still in his teens, Walter became the principal cellist of the Rheinische Musikschule Orchestra. So, establishing his bona fides as a performer by giving a series of concerts and recitals all over Germany, he divided his time between concert tours and teaching. During the years 1930 to about 1933, 
He undertook two performance tours across Europe and Asia with a group of Italian musicians venturing as far as Calcutta. In 1940, Walter emigrated to Shanghai, where he served as head of the cello department at the Shanghai Municipal Conservatory and was the principal cellist of the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra until 1951, which is a full two years after the communist takeover. While in Shanghai, Walter performed both synagogue and secular music for appreciative refugee Jewish gatherings, as well as for general audiences. Additionally, he often joined his brother Otto to play Unterhaltung's music. Both Joachim brothers exhibited eclectic musical tastes as performers. And uh, Walter left. Did he leave China or did he uh, stay behind? Yes. Walter left China to join Otto in Montreal in 1952. He soon advanced to the chair of principal cello in the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, as well as holding the same position in the McGill Chamber Orchestra. Walter actually returned to China in 1987 and 1991 at the age of 75 and then later 79, this time as an invited guest teacher at several music schools. So obviously China was not a nightmare for Walter. He, he came back. He wanted to go back. I see. And, and during the time that they were uh, living in the Hongqiu mm-hmm. ghetto, which was established on February 18th, 1943, what kind of difficulties did these musicians in particular face yes. in the well, ghetto? Roughly 18,000 Jewish refugees from Central and Eastern Europe were relocated into this sector. Uh, So the ghetto in Shanghai differed from its counterpoints in Europe. Not only was there an absence of encircling walls, but there were only a few barriers erected at some of the checkpoints where Japanese soldiers, Russian police, and I believe uh, Jewish civilian guards were posted. The 15,000 refugees were not totally isolated as the small district of about one square mile had a population of about 100,000 Chinese most of whom had been unwilling to leave their homes. So no one was officially permitted to leave the restricted area without a pass, although there have been numerous refugees who have testified that it wasn't that hard to leave the ghetto illegally. Moreover, every stateless refugee, which means the Jewish community, in the ghetto had to register with the Japanese police. So during this period, uh, after 1943, were they stuck there? Were they able to get out? Were they able to perform? Right. Well, the musicians had been allowed to move across districts within Shanghai before the coerced confinement right at at Hankyu Ghetto, but they found that despite being strictly confined to the restricted area, that the appetite for musical experiences endured even in the face of such constraints. So musicians performed often for minimal wages or without fees at all because they felt, and the community felt in Hankyu, that music constituted a precious, sustaining cultural element for the refugee community, where all were subjected to extreme poverty, and most survivors remember particularly the awful pangs of hunger that came from starvation, which were sometimes allayed by music and other cultural activities. And to answer your point directly, a few were able to kind of either get some permission from the king of the Jews or <laughs> or just wangle their way out. Because as I said before, it was not that difficult to, to leave sort of illegally. The only problem is if you got caught, you might get executed. I tell you, this is, this is quite a story. If you think about it, you know, these world-class classical musicians of so much renown in their homeland, you know, living rough like they were in Shanghai. I mean, that's so that's so beautiful that even amongst the close quarters and for some living in squalor, yes. you know, that they they got to listen to the music of their homeland from really the best there was at that time in wartime Shanghai. So, and I'm sure more than, uh, you know, as you indicated, more than the stateless refugees in Hongqiu enjoyed the music. Right. Did the musical performances continue at these cafes and ticketed venues during the worst years in Shanghai, or did that sort of go on hold for a while? Yeah, well, I mean, this is very important. There was very little money for formal classical recitals, um, and even less large-scale operettas and orchestral concerts in larger theaters, because 
there was just, even though there was the demand, there was just not any money to pay fees. And they eventually found that they really gravitated uh, more towards cafes where people could put down a few, you know, just a few coins and, and buy, I don't know, a sandwich or something like that. So you have really sort of the rise of cafes where Unterhaltung's music, light music, was played. This is what we identify as jazz. And I think what's really interesting about Unterhaltung's music uh, is that it was promoted by the Third Reich, even though you can really trace it to American popular music of that time, just because it was so popular <laughs> that even though it was not reliant on German ethnic content and concepts, it was just too popular to ignore. And this is where Shanghai classical musicians also found it was too important, too popular to ignore. So many uh, classically trained musicians found themselves playing light music in cafes because that was the way they could make money. And that, in fact, was not only in the ghetto. That was also other in other places outside the ghetto in Shanghai. You know, this was, it was quite extraordinary to have this level of talent in China mm -hmm. all in one place yes, at yes. one time, too. Yes, yes. So during this time, I know there was so much daily interaction mm -hmm. between these musicians and their Chinese neighbors. And I'm wondering, did they teach or serve as inspiration for any any noteworthy uh, Chinese musicians, especially those in China who went on to great things yes, post-1949. Yeah. Uh, who was there? Yeah, so I think it's been established that of the 23 Chinese composition students of Frankel who can be identified by name, several became leading national music figures, such as Ding Shanda. Ah, the Long um, March Symphony. Right, Santong, uh, Chu Shishan, uh, Duan Ping Tai, and Zhang Hao. Yeah, uh, Chu Chu Shishan. She mm -hmm. was a, she was a giant during yes, the fifties exactly. and sixties. Right, right, right. And then Schloss taught also Ding Shanda, Chu Shishan, Santong, Tang Zhengfang, Huang Yijun, and Chen Chuanxi. And these all became leading Chinese composers and pedagogues over the following decades. So the impact on Chinese music. And Chinese musical training is enormous from these two musical modernists, yeah, as, and, I, as uh, I mentioned. Chen Chuanxi, he was one of the four great conductors of China. There you go. Si da yue zhu hui jia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, now Mr. Wittenberg, the violinist, his students, what's it strange, is his most famous student uh, was Fu Cong who was the first Chinese pianist to achieve international recognition as a prize winner in the 1955 International Chopin Competition. Yeah, he was the Lang Lang of his day, and he was the toast of uh, London and New York all throughout the 1960s. And Fu Cong, I don't know if you know, he was married to the daughter of uh, Yehudi Menyuan. Yes, and I believe that Fu Cong died in 2020 of COVID complications. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. I think one of the ironies, though, is that Fu Cong is a pianist, and his teacher, Wittenberg, is better known as a violinist. Mm. But of course, as I mentioned a little earlier, Wittenberg was very much respected as a pianist as well. And, uh, and then also he taught Tan Su, uh, Shujian, who is the future leader of the violin faculty and vice director of the Shanghai Conservatory of Music. Um, then there were others. Walter Joachim, the cello player, taught Situ Jiwen, who was later the youngest member of the Shanghai Municipal Orchestra, and then the first principal cello of the Central Philharmonic in China, uh, also founder of the Chinese Cello Society. And then there was another uh, a violinist, Samuel Adler, who taught Ming Lan Sheng, a professional violinist in Changzhou Symphony Orchestra. So where can you see the legacy of these musicians? I mean, they spent all that time in China and they interacted with all these students, many who you know became major figures in classical music in China. Where do you see the legacy of them today in China's classical music right. scene? Right. I think this is one of the reasons I was so delighted to do this episode with you, Laszlo, because outside of their community. Austro-German Jewish refugee musicians in Shanghai were essentially marginal, socially and politically. 
they remain unacknowledged in the general public consciousness because in Shanghai they did not produce internationally famous great works or uh, give celebrated performances that were known outside of Hankyu. Um, they were isolated by distance, language, and wartime exigencies, but nevertheless actively contributed to Shanghai's diverse musical life in both classical and popular genres, thereby influencing the history of music in China. They performed for and taught Chinese students who became leading composers, conductors, pianists, and instrumentalists of the People's Republic of China in succeeding decades. As Ming Liang Sheng's son, Fang Sheng, has asserted, many Jews express gratitude for Shanghai as a place of refuge, but they don't realize that the contribution they made back to Shanghai and to China as a nation is so important. They're giving us angry looks here at this recording studio in beautiful Scripps College, one of the Claremont Colleges. Another perfect sunshiny day here in Southern California. How this has been a real great pleasure. We started talking about doing this a long time mm -hmm. ago, and finally we did it. Yes. So I thank you for coming on the CHP and giving us uh, a musician's insight on these people, the history of the times they lived in and about their lives and the impact of their lives on others. So uh, that's it. Uh, I'm heading over to Jerchus at 3.30 for a mm. beer and to okay. solve all the uh, contentious issues in U.S.-China relations. <laughs> you're welcome to join us if you want. Any, uh, any last words? Well, I just want to thank you for, for focusing on this topic because I just think one of the issues we have to realize is how merged we are, that there's very little pure kind of national cultural traditions. We're, we're all, we've all depended on each other for inspiration and for different kinds of influences. Hear, hear. Well said. Let's call it a wrap. Our thanks to Micah Huang for all the sound editing. I'm sure more than a few of you were thinking, wait a second, this sounds too professional to be on the CHP. Thanks, Micah. This is Lazo Montgomery signing off here on behalf of Hao Huang and ourselves, and I hope we pass the audition. Please take it under consideration to join us next time for what's gearing up to be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. 